I would like to welcome everyone to the MLN uh, webinar, Mapping the NAPA, Treating Settler Colonialism. I'm sure it'll be a very engaging and interesting look into the history of the NAPA and to what the uh, term will mean within the contemporary setting. I'm not gonna take too much time. So I would like to pass the floor to our moderator today, Professor Ilan Papin. Professor Papin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, just a small, uh, before we begin, and I will, uh, con congratulate and welcome everyone. Who, uh, one of our speakers had some technical issue, uh, Dr. Hiva Yazbag, so she will join us uh, as the last speaker, if that's okay. And if uh, Dr. Salman and Dr. Rona don't mind to be pushed ahead, if you're ready, I really appreciate your cooperation on this. And I'm sorry that this is a kind of a last moment. <laughs> uh, um, kind of uh, bureaucratic administrative thing. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are. Uh, the movement for liberation from Nakba covers such a huge geographical span that uh, we need to do all these congratulations and blessings from the morning to the night. Um, we are a group of human rights activists and organizations who particularly focus on uh, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, Africa, uh, uh, in order to disseminate uh, information and knowledge, both about the Nakba, the catastrophe of 1948, but also about the ongoing catastrophe uh, uh, in Palestine. Uh, unlike the United Nations, we don't only commemorate the Nakba one day in a year, we commemorate and talk about the Nakba almost every day, every year, because we believe that this is something that should be acknowledged recognize and more important than anything else rectified um we uh, have been doing some excellent webinars in the past uh and uh we still hope to do uh, uh, webinars like this uh in in the uh, future before i uh, present to you our uh, speakers uh i would like to um say a few words uh for those who are less familiar with the term or the events, although I'm sure many of our uh, viewers uh, would know a, a, a quite a lot about the events of 1948. So what I'm going to do in very few minutes, because I don't want to take too much time out of uh, the valuable time of our uh, guests, um, is just to uh, draw in very general lines um, uh, what happened in, in 1948. I also want to mention that we will devote the whole year for webinars uh, on the Nakba. Uh, this is the first one out of others to come that will cover uh, different aspects, both of the catastrophe itself uh, and the, the ongoing catastrophe, but also on the resistance to the catastrophe, what we call the ongoing intifada next to the ongoing uh, Nakba. Uh, when Britain left uh, uh, Palestine uh, in, in May 1948, uh, it was already uh, a, a, situ a, a period in which uh, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians became refugees as a result of an ethnic cleansing operation carried out by the Zionist uh, forces. This is an important uh, chronological fact that usually is misrepresented and fabricated by the Israeli propaganda, namely before Britain left Palestine and before any Arab soldier entered Palestine in an attempt to save the Palestinians, before that happened, the Zionist forces already carried out a massive ethnic cleansing operation, especially in uh, the towns of Palestine uh, and in the mixed towns of Palestine. And it was this ethnic cleansing operation that pushed uh, uh, public opinion in the Arab world to pressure the governments to do something. And when they did, it was too late and too little. Within nine months, since February 1948 until the end of that year, the Zionist forces destroyed half of Palestine's villages, more than 530 villages, de-Arabized, depopulated most of the Palestinian towns, and made half of Palestine's population refugees. On the ruins of the Palestinian villages and neighborhoods, the Zionist uh, state either built uh, colonies or planted recreational uh, parks. This was uh, a crime against humanity that was witnessed by the world. There were a lot of emissaries 
a representative of the international community on the ground, journalists, representative of the International Red Cross of the United Nations and, uh, and, and other organizations. And in fact, as an historian, I know that I can use some of this material to reconstruct what happened in 1948. But the managements, the editorial boards, the directorships of all these organizations which had representative on the ground that witnessed with their own eyes the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, all these uh, uh, bosses, if you want, of these organizations decided knowingly not to publicize what their people on the ground were sending to them. Unfortunately, this is still goes on. If you read the reports of the consulates uh, in East Jerusalem or the legations in Ramallah, you can see that uh, many countries in the world receive quite accurate uh, reports of what goes on in the West Bank, inside 48 Palestine or in the Gaza Strip. But uh, these reports never make it uh, to the mainstream the media or mainstream politics in the West. So this is a structural ignore, uh, a, a attempt to deny the uh, criminal policies on the ground. But the Nakba was not just the destruction of villages and towns and the Israeli uh, uh, project of erasure of any memory of any remnant uh, of the existence of Palestine before 1948. The Nakba is also the destruction of careers of people who uh, would build them, would rebuild their life later on and would become the human capital that helped neighboring Arab countries and as far as the Gulf, Gulf countries to rebuild new countries, new educational system, financial systems, cultural system, this human capital that could have been invested in a free and liberated Palestine in 1948 benefited many countries in the Arab world. But the human capital of Palestine is still there, even 75 years after the Nakba. And when, in webinars like this, we are not just lamenting what happened. And we are, of course, committed to tell accurately what, what had been done to the Palestinians in 1948. But we are also celebrating the Palestinian resilience, resistance, and uh, determination to continue the struggle for liberation and one that hopefully, when it succeeds and unfolds, would rectify whatever can still be rectified of the disaster inflicted upon the Palestinians by the Zionist movement in 1948. In this webinar, we are talking to people who used different materials in order to reconstruct what happened in the Nakba. Because it has to be understood that although Palestinians, of course, were very much aware of what happened in 1948, and many people in the Arab world knew what happened in 1948, there was uh, a campaign of denial uh, in the rest of the world. And not enough people knew what happened. Not only that, they were misled by a counter narrative that actually denied the catastrophe and blame the Palestinians uh, for their own suffering. It is the work of historians, human rights activists that used archival material, oral history testimonies, maps, clips, and everything they could put their hand on that enabled us not just to talk about justice for Palestine, but also to show professionally and accurately that what happened in 48, the magnitude of the disaster and, uh, and, and unfold and expose the picture in its full, uh, 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 in, in clear colors, uh, uh, if you want, in high definition, so that nobody can go on and deny uh, that uh, within nine months in 1948, uh, Palestine was uh, exposed to a cruel campaign of ethnic cleansing. I would end by saying that the Zionist movement as a settler colonial movement, in fact, already started the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians in the 1920s, when the Zionist movement bought land in Palestine from mostly absentee landlords who lived in Beirut, they already asked and succeeded in convincing the British government to expel villagers from various parts of Palestine that the Zionist movement was able to purchase in the 1920s. And after 1948, because the ethnic cleansing was incomplete, it continued. It continued between 48 and 1966 within what became the State of Israel, 
where dozens of villages were ethnically cleansed in that period. It continued during the June 67 war, when hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were ethnically cleansed from the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And it continued ever since then until today with uh, an incremental ethnic cleansing. And I think some of you are particularly aware of the campaigns of ethnic cleansing in the greater Jerusalem area, in the Jordan Valley, in the Nakab, and in the south of Mount Hebron in, Masaf, in the area called Masaf Iyata. With this, I would now uh, move to our uh, speakers. And I think uh, if I'm right about the, the order, I think we have Dr. Salman Abu Sita first, Hassanel. Is that true? Yes, yes, yes we, we do. Um, some of us and then Dr. Hiba after Okay. Okay, Salman. And, and, and then maybe Rona and we'll put Hiba in the end, if that's okay. 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 So I'm very, very happy. Uh, uh, that we have uh, my dear friend for more than 25 years, uh, Dr. Salman Abu Sita, a, a, a Palestinian researcher, researcher and most known for mapping Palestine. Many of you, I'm sure, have his Nakba map with all the destroyed villages on it, either in Arabic or in English. Uh, uh, Salman Abu Sita developed a practical plan for implementing the right of return of the Palestinian refugees, which you can see in various places, including in his own website. And he also created a new center in the American University in Beirut that would continue the sacred work that he has done on mapping both cartographically and humanly, demographically, economically, and culturally, uh, Palestine before 1948, during 1948. And he leaves us with great hope of how Palestine would look like in if, when, not if, when, it will be liberated, uh, inshallah, in a, in a, in a, as soon as possible. Salman, thank you very much for joining us. I know you're a very, very busy man, and uh, I know this is morning for you. Uh, so thank you again, and the floor is yours, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing you with all the rest of us. Thank you very much, my dear friend, Ilan. Thank you so much uh, uh, for this introduction. And thanks to our friends, uh, Noor, uh, Hassan and Noor, and uh, uh, our friends east of Palestine, all the way from uh, here um, to uh, Pakistan, Malaysia, East uh, India, and as far as New Zealand and Australia, which I visited uh, for a long time in uh, 2019. Uh, thank you all very much uh, because uh, uh, the East of Palestine is very important, as you know, Ilan and all of us, um, has been a great source in the United Nations to support uh, the rights of uh, Palestinians. Um, and uh, thank you, Ilan, once again for the introduction. You, you saved me um, uh, um, a bit of my time to do that, uh, so I'll not repeat what you have said. It's all very correct and very eloquent. Um, but I just need to say that a Nakba, as we all know, is ongoing, um, not only for 75 years, but also for 27,000 days and nights. And I count these because these are the times, the nights I did not sleep in my bed, in my birthplace. I became a refugee for this period of time exactly on that day, because on the 14th of May, 1948, we were surprised in my birthplace called Al Ma'in um, by uh, a 24 armored vehicles who came to our uh, place and they destroyed everything. They destroyed houses, they killed people. They, they destroyed particularly the school which my father built in 1920. Um, and um, they, uh, as a child, I saw the debris and the smoking the remains of the village uh, after and the next morning when we were hiding in a valley. Um, and I, as a child, I said, who are these people? I never saw a Jew in my life before. They told us they came from different countries and they speak different languages and their aim is to destroy us and to uh, depopulate us. So it was my mission, like um, many Palestinians now, the nine million Palestinian refugees today, is to strive all my life to return to my birthplace, uh, which I'm sure uh, is inevitable. But uh, let us look uh, at, at uh, history, current history. Um, there is nothing like a Nakba in history, in colonial history. A, a country like Palestine, ancient country, older actually than many European countries, 
located in the heart of the Arab and the Muslim world, Inva was invaded and occupied and emptied of its people who were driven into refugee camps. Its physical and cultural landmarks were obliterated, its geography taken over and renamed as, as it, the history is erased and uh, claimed to be the invader's own history. The heritage expropriated, um, the destruction hailed in the Western world as a miraculous act of God and a victory for few writers over the savage many, all done according to a premeditated plan, hatched outside the country, meticulously executed, supported by the same old colonial powers, armed with an array of historical and geographical falsehoods, falsehoods, where the word of truth, the voice of the victim, and the glaring facts of the crime are silenced and silenced, criminalized and forbidden, dubbed as the punishable curse of anti-Semitism. All this, all this is maintained, not for a period of uh, brief war, but for seven decades and still counting. There is nothing like that in history whatsoever. And as my friend Ilan indicated, the Zionist invasion of Palestine started actually before it was creation, before the British left, and before any Arab soldier came to rescue Palestinians. Um, 220 villages, including 11 main cities in Palestine were depopulated before something called Israel was declared. So in the six weeks from April to 14th of May, they conquered all these cities and 22 massacres have taken place. That is why what triggered the Arab uh, people's reaction and demonstrations in Arab capitals against the massacre of Darius Yassin. But it was only one of them. The tragic story of the massacres as a weapon of ethnic cleansing is striking. We made a detailed study of the correlation between the massacres, the place of the massacres, the time of the massacres, the brigade which took it, even sometimes denied the names of officers, with the depopulation. It was absolutely correlated. Uh, take, take a simple example, the blood of the victims in the massacres of Abu Shusha and Borer. On the 13th of May, their blood did not dry when Ben Gurion stood in Tel Aviv and claimed to declare, to declare the state of Israel. Ironically, he's calling upon Palestinians in this declaration to resort to peace and, um, and quietness and not to attack the new settlers. Who is attacking? The blood of these victims did not dry when he was speaking these words. But um, we are here, 75 years of Nakba. Um, people say it's a very long time. You have to reconcile yourself with it. Well, we say the opposite. It is really 75 years of resilience and opposition. And um, as you can see, last May, when the Israelis attacked Gaza for um, 10 times, six times in six years, uh, people in, in Jerusalem was, uh, was agitating and in the West Bank and even in Lid and Ramla and Mulfaham, they were agitating. And so Israel did not really have the deed of surrender by Palestinians, not at all. But we look forward to the future. Uh, as an engineer and planner, we have to think of ways um, to remedy this calamity. Um, well, first of all, we have the international law on our side. Uh, Resolution 194 was uh, affirmed 135 times in the United Nations. The longer history and the longer resolution in the history of the United Nations which makes this a cardinal principle of the United Nations. But we don't need these resolutions to tell our people that this is their country. We know we are connected with it in every possible way. What we have done in mapping of Palestine, we have uh, recreated every single place in Palestine before its destruction, every single place. Our maps and atlases are in English, Arabic, Spanish, and very soon will be in Russian as well. Um, they uh, describe um, 50,000 locations in Palestine, whether they are villages, cities, or 
valleys or hills or places or fields or whatever it is. 55,000 uh, names carved by the people themselves out of their life, out of their history. Um, this is the garden, olive garden of Sheikh Ali. This is the Pigeons Valley. Uh, this is the hill of whatever it is, historical and so on. These people, I call these names birth certificates, um, uh, of certificates of existence in the country. Now, all these names, all these names have been obliterated, removed. And on July 1949, Ben Gurion gathered his officers and experts of the Old Testament of geography and told them, now sit down, erase these names and create names for us, for the new Israel. They sat and created, created, not really built, not really created on a piece of paper, 6,800 names only, instead of 50,000 names. And these names are artificial, like, for example, Herzl Mountain or Ben Gurion Street or whatever like that, or Ben Gurion Airport. All these names are carved by a committee who are sitting on a table trying to create an artificial country in the heart of the Arab and Muslim world and an integral part of Asia. Um, they, they did that and they created um, um, the, um, uh, this uh, geography of Israel. But we did not stop there. We have data for all the Palestinians in every village. We know their names, we know their families. We know what land they own. We know uh, their history. We have 400 books written by people of the village, each village written about its own people. We know their customs, you know their family branches and, and hamulas and so on. And we also know where they are today. We know in which refugee camp they live. We can plot on a screen uh, any village and we tell you where the people of that village are in which refugee camps, whether in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Palestine, West Bank, and Gaza. We know that. We, in reverse, also can know, if we look at uh, Al-Baqa refugee camp in, uh, in Amak, we know where these people come from. We can plot them in the map. When we plotted um, the routes of return, it's amazing, it's amazing. The longest distance will be around 40 kilometers. But there are distances which are zero distances, like the distance of refugees in Gaza. They could actually walk back to home, or actually walk. They don't need ships. They don't need operational Moses. They don't need that. They can just walk back. And why is Gaza Strip uh, uh, very densely populated? Why? Because they are the people of 247 villages in the south of Palestine. They have been attacked and depopulated through several, at least a dozen or two massacres and pushed into Gaza Strip. What is their home place? Their home place is half of Palestine, Southern Palestine, 50% of Palestine. And now they are living in 1.3% of Palestine. This concentration camp is alive today. You don't need to read history books. It's alive today where the people in southern Palestine, 50%, are crammed into 1.3%. But we don't even cry about that. Well, let me just add one point at this point. When they return, they will return to approximately an empty land. All the settlers in the southern Palestine who took their land are only 62,000 people, which are less than one refugee camp in Gaza. So when the people in Gaza return, they will be affected affecting affecting only 62,000 settlers in that. I am excluding here Palestinian village, uh, cities, which have been totally, uh, became totally Jewish, namely Be'er Seba, Be'er Sheba, and Al-Sdud, and Asqalan. Um, we don't stop like um, at this point. We plan for the return. Um, we, when Palestinians return, as I said, we know their roots, we know which road they are following. Sometimes we know how many buses they need if they don't walk. But when they come home, they find a deserted place, a demolished place. As my friend Ilan said, um, Jewish National Fund is hiding the debris 
of these uh, destroyed villages by parks named after Western politicians who supported the destruction of Palestine. But that is no problem for us at all because we have data. We have, we have 10 files for each village of, um, and we know their aerial photographs. We know the maps they have. So what we did in the last seven years, every year we started a new competition between or among uh, Palestinian young architects for their graduation to get a degree in architecture. We said your graduation project is to select a village in Palestine and design it. And here is the data uh, for what it was. And here is the data for what we expect it to be. 10 times more population now with internet, with electricity, with all that. Here it is, go and design it. And we have a British jury of architects, distinguished architects, who receive their applications each year, and they de declare the first three winners. You have no idea how much the British jury, architectural jury, are amazed at the brilliance, inventiveness of these young Palestinian artists. They recreated the village in the same place for the same people, but of course, larger and more modern like that. And we have very you know, touching stories like that. The people who won the um, design for Sahmata village, which is in Galilee, are a group of young uh, men and women in Gaza University, in Gaza. They have never seen Galilee. Uh, uh, and, but their design was absolutely amazing. Um, and when that happened, um, we actually let the winning team meet, meet the people of Sahmata. Thanks to um, uh, the new technology, we gather people of Sahmata, not only mainly in Lebanon, but some of them are in Denmark and in Canada, and they meet and the young people tell them how they built their village. And the elders in this village are amazed. Say, here is Madafa, here is uh, Mukhtar House, here is uh, the mosque or church or something. It's really amazing experience. We have so far uh, amassed 270 Palestinian architects working on this. The, uh, we almost completed the construction or reconstruction of 500, uh, sorry, 50 to 60 villages. But we divided them geographically because they what we call vernacular architecture because some of them um, are in the high galilee where they have stones and some in the coastal strip where they have materials which are not stone materials maybe ground and earth material and so we divided this into 10 vernacular architecture areas and we have samples of each one of them and by the way just i want to conclude um when this happens, it's very easy. We have enough engineers, enough labor, they're qualified. They build similar, even bigger projects in the Gulf. So they can build the uh, destroyed uh, villages in, uh, we plan four to six years. And the cost of that is minimal, minimal cost. And I think if people can, can take care of that without outside help. But, but the reparations which are due according to seven articles in the United Nations by, from Israel by the destruction is more than enough to cover the cost of construction. And by the way, if I am an American citizen, I would be very glad because it will be cheaper for an American taxpayer to give us this amount for one year instead of the amount America paid to Israel every year. So in, shama, in summary, right of return is sacred, legal, and possible. And it can be done without detriment to the uh, 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 Jewish citizens now who wish to live in, in a free democratic country. Um, there is no problem. The space is enough. And we have shown there will be minimum displacement of um, Israeli Jews who want to remain in Palestine. There is one condition which is not negotiable. No Zionism, no apartheid, no racism, Nothing of that kind. This is the only uh, recipe for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Salman, uh, uh, telling us exactly how to fight erasure and uh, denial. Uh, 
the projects that you mentioned in the second half of your uh, talk uh, really uh, makes it uh, clear to us that the future generations would not forget what happened and would have an infrastructure on which to build the continued struggle for repatriation, return, and compensation. Uh, and uh, uh, it's incredible to hear how many young people, uh, even in places uh, such as Gaza, are involved in such a project. It gives us hope, uh, and it shows us, as I was trying to say in the introduction, that the Nakba, on the one hand, is a story of destruction, but it is also, on the other hand, a story of resilience and resistance. Uh, and Palestinians were not just victims, there were also people who, uh, under the most impossible conditions, uh, uh, rebuilt their life and continued the struggle to get back what was taken from them uh, unlawfully and by force uh, in 1948 and even before 1948. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Salman Abu Sita, for sharing with us. Uh, what we'll do now, we'll show a clip uh, uh, which was uh, prepared by Dr. Rona Sela and, and others, and she will say some few words on it later. Uh, the importance of this clip is it, it really complements what uh, Dr. Abusita was talking about. Uh, one, one way of reconstructing the past and understanding is, of course, the physical building of models of villages that were destroyed and, and, and accumulating information about them in order to dehumanize the story of the refugees and the destroyed villages and neighborhoods. Uh, a, a, one of an additional means of doing it is going through the archives and going through the archives of the ethnic cleanser itself, if you want the colonizer. Uh, uh, there's no better expert in the world than Dr. Rona Sela for guiding us of how do you use the archives of the, of the colonizer in order to uh, understand uh, better the full picture of what happened in 1948 and after 1948. So we'll, we'll show a clip now, uh, and uh, then uh, Dr. Rona Sela would uh, uh, address this and other issues that she prepared for us. And we will finish uh, with Dr. Uh, Hiba Yazbak. Let me just introduce uh, uh, Dr. Rona Sela right now so that we can immediately go to her uh, after uh, the, um, the clip. Uh, Dr. Sela is a curator, uh, a researcher, and film director, director focusing on visual aspects of Zionist Israeli settler colonialism, its oppressive mechanism, and on knowledge production and erasure. She also deals with the methods to correct colonial patterns, such as building post and decolonial archives, uh, all through activism by civil society uh, agents. So, uh, Hassanel, we are. I think we are ready for the clip. December 21st, 1942. The village has 8,000 dunams with orchards, orange groves, fruit, and olive trees. They also engage in fishing. The village has 20 fishermen. Freshwater spring, with an abundance of water, is in the northeast of the village. The houses are built of marble and stone, the new ones from cement. There are cactus fences. The village has a government school with 50 students, as well as 10 shops and two cafes. The main road from Haifa to Beirut goes through the village.
Al Haram, February 1940. The village has a land area of about 10,000 dunams. The village where the Prophet Ali is buried was founded many years ago. Surrounding the tomb is a large building containing about 50 rooms. On the beach near the village, watermelons from the surrounding fields are loaded for Beirut and Egypt. Every year during the watermelon season, visitors come from all the villages in the country to visit Sidna Ali's grave. The visitors bring meats with them to offer as a sacrifice in honor of the Prophet. Workers mostly from Yaffa and Egypt set up tents. When the trade in watermelon is over, they dismantle the tents and everything is returned to its place. The village was founded 220 years ago. The village has 1,600 inhabitants. There is a motorized well. Next to the well is a pool, where the village women come to get water. There are also many cisterns for rainwater used for watering the sheep and cattle, for washing and sometimes for drinking. There's a school with 100 students and one teacher from Yaffa. The village has carpenters, builders, and other experts from the quarry and lime industries. There are also seven stores in the village. The village was founded about 900 years ago. The village covers an area of 7,000 dunam. The number of residents is 1,800. The Yaffa Jerusalem Railway goes past the village and there is a train station. The residents travel by train to Yaffa, Lid, and Jerusalem. During winter months, it's difficult to reach the village by car, as the soil is a heavy red loam. Around the village are fenced orchards, with three paths running between the orchards. There are also acacia trees and cactus. Adjacent to the village is a large wadi, raven. There are no craft workers in the village, other than the basket weavers. The village spreads over 12,000 dunam on a flat plain. The number of persons is 400. The village has flowing water. In the north of the village is a well from which the residents get their drinking water. And there are 15 springs for the irrigation of vegetables and citrus fruits. An unpaved pedestrian path exits the Haifa Akka asphalt road and there is a narrow road for cars. The village buildings are built of stone with concrete roofs and wooden arcs. The village has goats, sheep, cattle, horses, camels, donkeys and chickens. The village has a school paid for by the residents. 50 students study there.
to Director of the Antiquities Department. Subject, Workers' Housing, Majdad Sadiq. April 19th, 1950. We propose to establish housing for 300 families of workers from Petah Tikva, some to be lodged in the houses of the abandoned village. New houses will also be built on the village slope in the belt between the village and the road. Mr. Detevsky, Meonot of Dim, 17A, Rechavia, October 8th, 1950. Regarding housing immigrants, Olim, in Majdel Sadek, Roshahain. We view the planning of the village of Majdel Sadek as extremely urgent. Please cooperate with Mr. Karim from the Absorption Department of the Jewish Agency and Mr. Florental from the custodian of absentee properties regarding the necessary arrangements such as survey, planning and the like in order to repair the houses in the village. David Zaslavsky, Director of the Department of Planning and Development. Custodian of Absentee Property, October 16, 1950. Regarding allocation of land for a diamond factory in Majdil Sadek, your letter of August 16, 1950. In reply to your letter regarding the matter in question, after various inquiries, it was agreed to designate the proposed area for the above mentioned project. Mr. David Zaslavsky, Director of the Department of Planning and Development. June 11, 1953, regarding allocation of land for housing immigrants in Majdel Sadiq. We hereby inform you of the allocation of land as planned for the purpose of housing immigrants in Majdel Sadiq, according to the map in your possession. 98 two-family houses, a total of 196 units. Sincerely, Mr. David Zaslavsky, Director of the Department of Planning and Development. To the Ministry of Housing, Department of Labor, from State Land Unit, Urgent, September 24, 1954. Subject, the former school at Majdel Sadek. An industrial enterprise contacted our office to rent the above structure. The Petah Tikva Workers' Council recommends this request. November 13th, 1955, to the Ministry of Housing, Department of Labor, Land Unit, Subject, Majdel Sadek, your letter of October 19th, 1955. In reply to your letter, we are referring to the area of the abandoned village of Majdel Sadek. The village and the area surrounding it is intended for an agricultural settlement. Sincerely, Secretary of the Effect Regional Council.
Thank you, Hassanel. Thank you for, for showing us. As you can see, it, it takes five to six years to destroy the heritage of one village. Uh, so deep and profound was the Palestinian presence on Palestine that you need years in order to erase one village. Uh, and that's, for, well, that's why thinking about Dr. Abu Sita's uh, work with the, with the students and so on, you cannot uproot, I think, Palestine from the Palestinians from Palestine, and you will never succeed. Uh, Dr. Uh, Rona Sela, thank you for your patience, and thank you so much for being with us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Um, first of all, I would like uh, to thank the organizer, Hassanal and Ranja, for the invitation to speak today and for screening the film. Second, I want to thank Dana Dura. I hope she's still here. She's teaching today, but I hope she's still here for the remarkable editing and animation and to Amir for the sound. Thank you so much for your inspiring work. Dana, your peacefulness and creativity contributed essentially to this film. Over the years, Ilan Pape and I had long, had long conversations about the archives and its, and its role. What was already founded, what should be established in terms of contents, sources, and concepts. And one day, I received a message from Milan Pape, join me to establish the Palestinian archive. Thank you, Ilan, for the trust and cooperation, for giving me the opportunity and necessary space to create the film. Originally, the film aimed to assist in raising money for the Palestinian archive and enriching the young generation and the public in large, discussing the importance of the archive in the life of the community. I believe today, as a film essay, and I call it today a film essay, and we'll, we can speak about it later, I think today it stands for itself. So thank you, Ilan, for your generosity and for the inspiration to establish the archive. Okay. Since 2009, when I first published the book Made Public, I deal with Palestinian sources in Israeli archives. I show how Israel and its archives became a major source of information about the Palestinians in various ways. The first way, discussed in my previous film, Looted and Hidden, deal with the seizure, with the seizure and looting of Palestinian archives, cultural treasure, cultural treasures and, histor and historical sources throughout the 20th century and the power exerted over them in Israeli archive. I show how these materials were not only captured and taken by force, usually in a deliberate way by intelligence bodies, but also controlled in Israeli archives. Their meaning was altered, rewritten, manipulated, concealed, erased, and censored. I deal with the regime of knowledge, how it was produced or erased for colonial purposes. The second way discussed in this film deals with knowledge that was actively gathered by Jewish and Israeli colonial bodies, soldiers, scouts, spies, officials, and archivists. They collected information about the Palestinian, about the Palestinians in Palestine before, during, and shortly after the Nazi. This knowledge production starts with the gathering of information about the Palestinian villages and cities, village files, aerial photographs, textual surveys, reports, and information on Palestinian residents. It was collected by Jewish military forces before the Nakba for the purpose of occupation, control, and surveillance. The film also deals with the way the settler colonial machine was activated. It describes the collaboration between many Israeli bodies, how they operated, destructing the Palestinian villages, allocating their lands to Israeli settlements, transforming the Palestinian villages into Israeli one. So in the first part of the film, I use intelligence information carried out by Jewish scouts, soldiers, and pilots. The aerial photographs of, Palestine, of the Palestinian villages, for instance, were taken by the Jewish Palmach squadron 
from the end of 1946, they helped in, in identifying the terrain and in building topographical maps of future military objectives, thus allowing control over areas that had no other means of access. The survey included comprehensive and detailed information about the villages and their inhabitants, historical, demographic, demographic including the structure of families and clans, as well as architectural, agricultural, means of transport, military, social, educational, economic, and commercial, as well as information on, ma on uh, major roads leading to the village, as we saw in the film, the village topography, water supply, and more. The surveys contain two extensive civilian information, historic, historical, social, demographic, demographic and, economic, and economic data that today awakens the ghost of the Palestinian life. This information helps imagining the nature of social life, the dynamics surrounding springs and sources of water, the orchards, fields, shady groves, family life, use, romantic hiding places, agricultural life, transportation, and more. Although this informative database of photographs and surveys was dry in character and served a military operational purpose before and after the Nakba, today they provide a great deal of information and an updated picture of the life of Palestinian society before the catastrophe. Thus, I suggest reading them from button up or against the brain, as Anne Laura Stoller defined, creating new archival tools to confront the present. So in my film, I use settler colonial sources that were, that were created via mechanism of erasure and concealment. I propose to challenge their modes of reading, their practices, by neutralizing their oppressive colonial content and meaning and directing them into a new channel that counter their original goals and return them to indigenous Palestinian history. This is an alternative database structure on material from the colonizer archives, challenging the one-sided worldview. I must emphasize that this, this is only a portion of the knowledge available about the Palestinian life and its history, and will join material from Palestinian sources and by Palestinian researchers and others, as we have seen in the marvelous uh, talk by uh, Professor Salman Abusita. Here I focus, but I focus on colonial archives. I show how they try to erase history. I want, they show, these archives, sorry, their aim was to erase history, but I want to show that history cannot be erased. They too teach these colonial uh, sources, teach us about Palestinian civilian life before the Nakba, about the tragedy experienced by the Palestinian population, about and about the traces of destruction left in its wake when the colonizers took possession and ownership of the indig indigenous property and its cultural treasures, erasing all traces of their original identity. This is an archival model that starts at a different point in time while the refugee is not yet a refugee. Some people would say a time of utopia. By taking action, this counter archive aims to restore the lost archive, real and emotional. And in the words of Elias Huri, this is the memory of those who were exiled from the map. And I will repeat it. This is the memory of those who were exiled from the map. This is at the time of Yunus, the era of Babel Shams, the refugee from Shaib, exiled to Lebanon from Palestine during the Nakba. He established cells of men seeking a way to return to their land, while his wife, children, father, and mother were forced to live in houses of another Palestinian refugee in Dir al-Assad. To finalize, 
the archival sources discussed here, the, 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 the materials from the colonizer archives, that served as a weapon against the Palestinians, as well as the looted materials held by Israel, should be returned to the Palestinians and become a site of resistance. They should be organized according to a different indigenous logic, charting the blind spots of the settler colonial archive, or measure the silences as, as Piva Gayatri showed. This anti-colonialist discourse required, according to Homi K. Baba, an alternative set of questions, tactics, and strategies, locating the various painted evidence of colonialism. However, at the same time, we have to bear in mind that this is a long and vague process, as we don't know exactly what Israel holds, and as many and, and as long, materials are still closed and censored in Israeli archive. Materials that may be censored for an unlimited period of time, according to the Israeli law. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rona. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I guess catching up and dovetailing on your, on your last sentence, I think some, some researchers uh, estimated that uh, uh, the Israeli archives have declassified only 2% of the 1948 um, uh, documentation, and, and we and especially are still covering up uh, atrocities, war crimes, and so on, which they themselves documented. A lot of countries and organizations that commit crimes against humanity uh, have a tendency to document what they are doing. We know it from the past from different places. So this documentation uh, is there. Uh, it's declassified, hopefully not uh, destroyed, but I think it's very important to decolonize knowledge, to decolonize the archives, and together jointly uh, uh, continue to reconstruct uh, what happened in 1948, to reconstruct life before the Nakba, and also reconstruct, reconstruct the way Palestinians rebuilt the life and began the struggle uh, after 1948. A very important part of uh, this kind of reconstruction is uh, our testimonies and oral histories. And a lot of Palestinians ha uh, have been recently involved in great projects of oral history. And, and no, no less important uh, is the, the voices of women uh, uh, that uh, are such an important part of the story of the Nakba not only as victims, but also as members of family who in many ways led the resilience uh, uh, after the dispossession and the destruction. And uh, we have no better person to talk about uh, these aspects of uh, reconstructing uh, the Nakba and defending its memory than our last guest, uh, Dr. Hiba Yazbak, who is a Palestinian politician sociologist and academic. She's a former member of Knesset representing uh, Balad, the, the, uh, or Al-Tajamu uh, uh, party, uh, 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 and also a member uh, of the Joint List uh, party. Her researchers focus on Palestinian society in Israel, this displacement, space, and gender issue. Uh, I'm very happy to have you with us, uh, Hiba. Thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, on the Saturday. I know you have your children as well to deal with, uh, but we will be your listeners and make sure that you can go back to your family as soon as you can. Thank you so much. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ilan, and uh, thanks for the organizers for the invitation. And actually, I thank you all for having me in uh, this important webinar to talk about Palestinian women and oral history issues and documentation. The Nakba events and the establishment of the State of Israel have resulted in a fragmented Palestinian society. The Palestinian exodus began with the acceptance of the UN partition plan on November 29, 1947. The 1948 Nakba turned about 750,000 Palestinians into refugees, leaving only some 150 Palestinians in their homeland, which became Israel and another 25 to 40,000 40, internally displaced persons, which are homeless within, within it. 
these are the subject actually of my recent research that uh, I'll be happy to share also uh, some insights uh, about it with you today. I propose to understand the displacement as, as part of ongoing settler colonial structure that have developed mainly since the beginning of the Nakba. For the displaced, this, this has been a traumatic experience involving murder and death, uprooting, house demolition, and the destruction of entire villages and neighborhoods, followed by the state oppression and movement restrictions. The displaced have lost their lands, homes, and often family members. Their voice has been silenced, their history marginalized. Adopted by many other groups victimized by colonialism, one way of addressing their exclusion from mainstream historiography is to document their oral history. The war and Nakba have severely affected the ability to write Palestinian history, as the Palestinians have lost many of their written sources, both as a direct result of the fighting and deportation, and indirectly as a result of cultural looting by the young state of Israel, as Dr. Rona Sela presented a few minutes ago regarding her pioneering work in, in, in revealing uh, the hidden materials. In this sense, physical uprooting also meant the uprooting of memory and legacy. Most of the Palestinian written legacy in areas that became Israel, such as in public libraries, personal diaries, uh, photo albums, municipal and press archives, hospital and school records, was destroyed, lasted, or uh, lost, sorry, or looted. This destruction was massive in the Palestinian cultural centers of Jaffa, Yaffa, Haifa, Haifa, and Al Quds, Jerusalem, a home, a home of a, a home. Of to the secular intelligentsia, the newspapers, and printing shops. Most of it can be found in the, national, in the National Library of Israel in Jerusalem. Combined with the highly biased and politicized historiography offered by, by, by the victors based on selective exposure of the archive materials under their control, this rules provides the rationale for focusing especially on oral history. Oral history narratives have been important to researchers, particularly in the field of forest migration, as it is often the only available source. This is mostly true in the case of the Palestinian in gen Palestinians in general and in the case of the displaced Palestinians, especially those who were displaced from the rural areas uh, who have lost all their property. As historians of PSNs and of uh, and other subaltern groups have emphasized, they do not leave their own documents behind and do not speak to us directly directly in archival documents, which are usually produced by and for the ruling classes. In my study, I found out that some informants are even illiterate, especially in the, the rural women, so that they had no opportunity to document even if they wanted to. Thus, conducting oral history research among elderly Nakba survivors makes the memory issue the memory issue critical. The process of live review in old age may compensate may compensate for the effects of aging by enhancing long term memory or at least slowing its decline compared to short term memory. Many interviewees have said things like, if you asked me what I did yesterday, I wouldn't recall, but I can tell you everything that happened when the Jews came. For them, the displacement is the main site of memory, as Pierre Noura calls it, with life divided into before and after, as the space and time history telling sessions are themselves a site of memory. Such sites are created by the, intersection, by the interaction of memory and history. Oral history is thus not only about the event, but also about its place and meaning in the witnesses' lives. Accordingly, human memory does a remarkably good job of, preser of preserving the general counters of the past and of accurately recording important events. Relatedly, one of the central challenges we face in the we face in, in, in doing oral history is the disappearing field. 
The literature has begun dealing with the Nakba generation and the displaced persons in particular very late. And as a result, we have very little oral documentation studies on this group. Among this silent group, we can easily find out that women were affected the most. Like the global case of war narratives, the silencing of women is a central issue in Palestinian historiography. According to Rachel Davis, study uh, in uh, study more than one one uh, 120 village memorial books have been published since 1948 mostly by men women are consulted as um, are consulted as uh, sources in less than half of these books and only in subjects such as songs handcrafts food and clothing their essential role in agriculture and their specialized skills in healing, midwifery, oral poetry, and collective memory work are hardly mentioned, nor is their share is in, pro in the property and economic trans uh, transactions. And here I have to mention, of course, the pioneering work of Rosemary Sayer among Palestinian women in the refugee camps in Lebanon. My starting point in writing history of Palestinian displacement takes gender as analytical category. This is part of my commitment as a historical sociologist to include the narratives of the, of the oppressed, particularly as the narrative of the displaced as a, a, as a community barely exists in Palestinian historiography. Moreover, we must not treat displaced women and displaced men as only two homogeneous group, but we have to be aware of Palestinian women's double oppression as Palestinians by Israel and as women by Palestinian society. So one key element in the Palestinian women's narratives is the distinction between urban and rural. Rural men have been relatively absent from the historiography of the Nakba. This is indicated as early as in Arif al-Arif seminal 1956 study. Rima Hamami also, who conducted perhaps the only study that examined the historiographical absence of rural women and men, suggests that within the male narratives of war and colonialism, the urban story is seen as more important. While the Palestinian peace and men represents the timelessness of agricultural life prior to 1948, he is not the land itself, but he is the significant of and immutable attachment to it. The Nakba suddenly thrusts him into non cyclical time. He is forced into modern history. For the rural man, losing control of the land meant losing control of his destiny, of his, of his very essence, something that cannot be said or uh, of his urban counterpart. Conversely, village women are often described as the abundances as objects that the masculine hero is trying to protect together with the land and community, remaining outside history and modernity. Although not totally silenced like their rural counterparts, only few urban women became active narrators of traumatic past and they, and they have not been allowed to narrate women's particular view, but represent the urban experience as a whole. As, uh, as in other historical contexts, Palestinian women have adopted the social stereotypes against them. Many of my valuable, valuable uh, informants, especially those displaced from villages, initially claimed lack of knowledge, despite being able to provide rich and important information as the interview unfolded. This was very much the general image, unless specifically told otherwise, people used to refer me in my research to men. And when asked specifically for women, they would often uh, uh, say things like, I know, I know women, but I don't think she can help you. Thus, most of the women I interviewed were contacted through the snowballing services of other women. As such, gendering the field is a main issue to deal with during the oral history projects. No doubt, writing oral history among Palestinian women is a mission that is still in its inf uh, infancy. Including women in the historiography is an essential issue, as, uh, as is the documenting and voicing of their narratives. Documenting oral history among elderly, elderly Nakba survivors and women survivors in particular is also an urgent mission, especially these days when Israel is doing its best 
to, let, to legitimize and normalize its crimes. It is also a way of confronting the occupation, colonial practices, Zionist erasure project, and put the oppressed and put the oppressed narrative and history in the center. Oral history validates Palestinian collective memory, rights, and claims. As such, it is more than a method of documenting narratives, but also a political tool. I hope that this oral documentation contributes not only to Palestinian history, but also to doing justice with these courageous women who for sure spread a legacy of truth, of justice, and hope for the coming generation and for liberation, return, and sovereignty. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hiba. Uh, we can see that uh, reconstructing the history uh, of the Nagba is also part of uh, the struggle for uh, gender equality, women's right, uh, that uh, indeed when you are rebuilding a future uh, uh, on the basis of a catastrophe and traumatic collective and individual past, uh, it's also a chance to heal and, and recover uh, aspects of the society uh, as a whole. And I think that's why so many people around the world have so many, and rightly in my mind, so much hope uh, about the Palestinian future once Palestine would be liberated. Because uh, uh, it is not just, it's a, it's a comprehensive struggle for justice in all its aspects, not just justice for the refugees, not just justice for the oppressed Palestinians, but justice for women, for workers, and so on. We are not building a utopian picture of post-colonial Palestine. We are, I think, building together a very realistic uh, uh, view of a country once liberated that would radiate and influence the Arab world as a whole and beyond. And I think that's why so many people around the world from different persuasions, from different cultures, from different backgrounds, see Palestine as epitomizing the struggle for justice uh, in the world. So thank you very much, Hiba, for highlighting uh, aspects that I think many of us who, who deal with the Nakba are not always aware of. And, and I think that really complemented very well uh, the contributions uh, today. We have time for uh, questions and answers. My suggestion is uh, the following, uh, that I would uh, read in one go uh, the questions, because they're not that many, but they're very important and would go uh, in a similar order that we uh, did the talks, and you can choose what part of the questions is relevant to you and answer, and maybe also use this uh, to for, for expressing your final thoughts on the topic, given also what you heard from other uh, contributors. I think that would uh, make sure that, first of all, we all hear the comments of everyone who, who, wanted, who made the effort, and thank you, for telling us what they think and so on. And then we also have a chance to go back to our uh, uh, speakers uh, and, and hear their thoughts of what is being commented and asked, but also of uh, uh, if there's anything else they would like uh, to add to our uh, webinar. So uh, uh, we have several comments from Leila uh, uh, Passa. Uh, uh, she said, thank you, Professor Pape and Dr. Salman for a gripping presentation. Thank you, uh, Leila. It is the Palestinian people's history that needs to be highly publicized. Very excited to see the engagement of artists, young people, and others in the rewriting of history. How can a global campaign in freeing Palestine use the factual narrative history be created? It is more than 75 years and too urgent not to be doing something globally in a large scale, especially together with the incredible human resources of Palestine that we have today. Leila also adds, about the film, incredible. Thank you, Dr. Rona. It should be shared very widely and worldwide. Visuals are very powerful. Can film festival be organized around the Nakba and get an audience outside of Palestine? And those who know nothing about Palestine, let alone its history and the rich cultural heritage. Uh, Irit Ben Moshe asked why the world did not, why the world did not and does not listen or tell about the continuing Nakba and how can it be changed? And Leila adds two uh, comments. Is it legal for the Israeli government to nationalize Palestinian property? So important to learn about the pre nakba and Nakba ongoing. How and where can we hear more about the women's contribution in reconstructing the Nakba? Great to hear from two women leaders here in the panel. 
Dr. Hiva, finally, thank you for highlighting women's role in this important point of history, their oral history, sharing experiences of the Nakba in spite of the gender biases they face. How are these women passing on to the younger women their stories and what measures are being taken to promote intergenerational work on this issue? So I suggest that uh, if each one of you will take uh, five minutes to uh, respond uh, and then I can uh, sum up the webinar, I would be very grateful. So Dr. Salman Abusita, if you don't mind, uh, we will begin with you if that's okay. And thank you very much, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I cannot help but um, I preface my uh, uh, comment on the wonderful work of uh, Nakba Archives. Um, it is a most valuable contribution um, and when I saw Rona film, I'm very, very touched uh, by um, the accuracy, the documentation of what we knew in our minds, but we did not see uh, in actual facts. So in the 1950s to 1960, uh, when Palestine emptied of its people, um, she demonstrated uh, very clearly uh, what happened and how people deliberately I mean, the Israelis uh, then we were called uh, deliberately destroyed um, the Palestinian landscape and replaced it by that. Um, but uh, the point which comes to mind immediately, that was the time when UNCCP in uh, Lausanne, uh, as you know, uh, Ilan quite well, were debating um, the re return of the refugees. And, and uh, Sharit, if I'm not wrong, uh, was discussing uh, how many we can uh, returned back and so on. This was done at the very same time they were destroying and rebuilding the, the destroyed places into for the for the um, new settlers. Um, um, so um, I salute the Nakba uh, archive and I urge everyone who hears us um, to contribute any data they have, contribute anything they can uh, uh, for for this. Um, just a quick remark about how we can promote the story of Nakba and actually return. Uh, I have a great faith in young people. Um, like Ilan, I have a chance to speak with them in Europe and America and even as far as Australia. And I find them very attentive, uh, very willing to learn. Uh, and in, uh, uh, it, it's surprising to some, many, um, Many of my audience, up to 30% or four, were, were, were Jews, young Jews. And they tell me, we have been cheated. We are not told about that. And uh, as you well know, uh, many of them are now in the uh, uh, you know, campaign to support Palestine. So they have fresh mind and they have good conscience, clean conscience, and they will not be contributing to the crimes committed uh, against Palestinians. So I think we should really uh, support them and uh, increase the campaign to let them know the facts. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that their opinion will change governments. But in due course, like in South Africa, the public opinion um, reached a point in which governments um, could not anymore support uh, an evil regime. Um, the situation in Palestine and Israel is different because the West has created Israel, as Bidin said, if we do not have Israel, we have to invent it. So the struggle is uh, continuing, but um, there is no question in my mind, um, the crimes in history cannot be uh, left uh, uh, unaddressed uh, anymore. Quick remark for Hiba. Um, Hiba, thank you very much for your explanation, but let me tell you something which you already know. You mentioned Rosemary Sire, my good friend and here. Um, uh, uh, rural women do not need uh, documentation. They actually, the ones who carry their children in uh, Nakba and set up a tent for them or under a tree and fed them while the men were just waiting and wailing and crying and so on. Women have really created the foundation for life after Nakba, in addition to before, of course. Um, and they do not need uh, uh, um, you know, external recognition. I mean, their children, their husbands, and so on do that. I salute them. Now, uh, urban women, as you know, they have drifted to Beirut or Cairo or something um, in, in good time. 
uh, unlike uh, uh, rural women, because rural men and women live on the land. They are born on the land and they die and be buried in the land. So the land for them is their life and they cannot forget that. Um, thank you both for uh, your very useful um, contribution. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Salman, with being with us. Thank you for your wise words. Uh, I will immediately, without any uh, delay, move to, to Rona, and, and then uh, we'll hear from Hiba. Sorry, Rona, you're muted. Okay, sorry. Um, you hear me, yeah? It's okay? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, we hear you. Um, fantastic. Um, thank you all for, for all the comments, and um, I'm honored here to be with uh, Dr. Salman Abusita and Dr. Hiba Yazbak, and of course with uh, Ilan Pape, Professor Ilan Pape. Thank you for all the Tremendous contribution, you know, to the research. Uh, and for me, uh, Ape and Abusita are, you know, the, the leaders, you know, of research. And and um, I'm grateful to, you know, to have the opportunity to speak together at the same panel. Um, I want to speak about censorship and erasure. Um, this week. Uh, Parliament member Ayman Uda invited me to the Committee of uh, Science and Technology at the Knesset about the uh, exposure and erasure of uh, Palestinian materials. And um, I think that uh, 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 one of the main problems, as Ilan uh, spoke, and as I also mentioned in my, in my talk, is the fact that Israel is afraid of the Palestinian history. And the Palestinian history that is stored in its archives, which cannot be erased. And for instance, uh, I read two instances about the massacre in, in Dir Yassin. I have a long correspondence with the archive. The last one that they, that they stated that it should be in 2022. And it's still censored. I interviewed the soldier who was in Dir Yassin. And uh, the, um, it's a long history, you know, the, the materials from the US scene, but uh, uh, the, the soldier told me what you can see in the photographs that Israel censor. Israel afraid of three photographs, okay? Only three photographs of the US scene. You see Palestinian hang on the tree. And you see the massacre. So why Israel still afraid of these three images? And they promised in the committee that they will rediscuss really it. But you know, the, their answer, you can expect what would be the answer. It will be closed again and again and again. And then the material that was taken in Beirut in 82, they uh, copied the archive, some of Parts of the archive were returned to the Palestinians, but uh, but they copied it without asking permission in advance to copy the material. They returned only part of the material, all the cultural uh, uh, archives, like dresses, like films, like photographs, like art exhibition, all of them are still uh, closed in the Israeli archive. But what they have returned, they copied and they gave to an Israeli institution, okay? And no, they do not uh, uh, reveal who received the materials. So you see the mechanism of power that's extracted, you know, by, by the Israeli archive in order to, to conceal history. But as I argue, history cannot be deleted. You always find testimonies, the power of testimonies, as Ilan said, documents. Every time something will come up, some evidence, some, some remains that will testify about what happened. So from my perspective, the fact that the 
that uh, Israel, you know, conceal or censor the material just teaches us, you know, that it has what to hide, okay? Otherwise, why they wouldn't open, you know, the material? So my, my personal uh, uh, fight is with the Israeli archives. As an Israeli researcher, and I admire the work that Hiba is doing and, and Salvana Busita is doing with Palestinian sources. This is highly important, but I'm in Israel, and I think my goal as a researcher is to fight to open the materials that are censored in Israeli archives and to release them and to reread, you know, a, a, these archives to point the mechanism of power that, that, that manage, you know, the Palestinian archive and to expose the material that is still open and to fight for opening the material that are still closed. So this is my mandate, you know, to work as an Israeli in Israeli archives. And I think together we can build the future Palestinian archive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Runa. Uh, Hiba, please. Thank you, um, and thank you, Dr. Salman Abusati, for your uh, for your note. And I would like to engage with it regarding the uh, the Palestinian women oral history. And I would like to say that one of our challenges is to bring out the uh, the, the stories, the narratives from the uh, private sphere into the public sphere, and to spread it and to share it. And I think that. Uh, this is this is our urgent measure, uh, mes mission uh, uh, nowadays because we know that we are working in a disappearing field, the field of the elderly Nakba survivors, the, especially the women, that they, they had a very essential role in uh, in keeping the uh, the Palestinian uh, narrative alive from generation to another another generation another generation, but unfortunately. They, they were marginalized and absent from the academic writings uh, and from the national discourse. They are, they are not there. So I think that one of, of my commitment and one of our urgent goals and missions is to bring, to bring these stories, these narratives, these very important narratives out of the public sphere <laughs> and, to, and, to, and to publish it. So I think that this, this needs, uh, this needs from us really to organize also our efforts and to make like um, a collective and uh, a collective and uh, union maybe or as well a uh, 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 efforts or projects in order to in order to have all of these testimonies together in order that we can really build an oral history archive that have the the, the narratives of the Palestinians, also who, uh, the people who were, uh, uh, who remained inside Israel, the people who are in Gaza and the West Bank and, and in, in the refugee camps and, and everywhere. We, w w I think that oral, oral history making among the elderly Nakba generation and uh, 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 is, is, is very urgent thing that uh, I think that women is the key uh, is, a, is a key uh, person and key is uh, and a major part of making and writing this history because uh, if we don't do things very very urgent and uh, uh, very urgent and quickly we could unfortunately lose uh, more and more narratives that are very important to for for our narrative for our national narrative for our equal narrative for our justice narrative and for resistance and for decolonize also the Zionist ongoing narrative. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Hiba. I think you. Let me just say some concluding remarks and then. We'll close the, the meeting with Hassanel uh, last uh, sentence. Um, the two points I really like uh, to, to mention. One is the importance of what uh, uh, Antonio Gramsci used to call cultural resistance. Cultural resistance is an integral part of the, a, a, a comprehensive resistance of a colonized and oppressed uh, people against the colonizer uh, and the oppressor. And, and what we, we learned today is that proper academic work, and as Dr. Abusita commented, accurate, professional, academic work is part of the struggle, is part of the cultural struggle, and therefore it's part of the struggle, which means that academics who work on Palestine are also activists, but it also means that activists have to be knowledgeable as academics 
on the topic. It's not enough to have slogans and a sense of justice. There's a need for proper research, proper understanding and knowledge. And, and I think uh, all of us who are a bit older are, are really hopeful and amazed by, by the willingness of the younger generation to study, to learn, to research, to continue the work of academics and of activists so that the knowledge production is both co is continuing and also uh, challenge, challenges the dominating uh, knowledge production by, by Israel and, and the Zionist uh, uh, movement. And this is my second point. I think we should not underestimate that the denial of the Nakba is still there. The refusal of the United States and European countries to participate in a simple uh, ceremony for commemorating the Nakba in the General Assembly is one of the most shameful moments in the history of the West. One of the most shameful moments in the history of the United States and Britain. To, to uh, boycott such a commemorative moment is really beyond comprehension. And it shows either ignorance, which I don't think there is, I think they know exactly what happened, but it shows cynicism and immorality of, of the global north, which is why one of the reasons we created MLN, because we believe the global south should be far more important in assisting the Palestinian in the struggle of the liberation because we're so disappointed by the global north and its hypocritical uh, 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 attitude uh, uh, towards the Palestine uh, question. This is, this came, uh, this just followed the un unbelievable remark by the, by the president of the European Commission that Israel bloomed the desert. I think what our research and activism shows that actually Zionism turned a blooming country into a desert. And, and I think that this is something that we should understand that some of the most educated uh, uh, people in the West, some of the most uh, brilliant academics still appear as total idiots and ignorant when it comes to Palestine. The, the only explanation for this is either they are intimidated or they are uh, bribed uh, uh, to, to say these things. Because one, one know, knows that at the level of education that they have, at the level of knowledge that they have, they cannot deny the truth. So if they deny the truth, there is a, a cynical uh, uh, reason uh, for it. Uh, and I think that's very important to understand what kind of a coalition of fabrication and lies we are uh, um, facing. But we're not giving up and we're not giving in. And that's the reason we created the movement for liberation of Nagwa for, as Dr. Abusita said, for east, east of Palestine. Uh, I'm sure enough people are working west of Palestine. So I think it's very important to continue the effort east of Palestine to educate, to disseminate, to debunk the mythologies, to expose the, um, the lies about, uh, about Palestine. It's the, the, the only crime against humanity in the second half of the 20th century that is still denied and concealed for too many people. But I'm sure that when we continue our work, this will not be the case in years to come. And I thank you all for, for your personal and individual efforts in, in, uh, uh, in contributing to defending the Nakba memory, in challenging the uh, project of fabrication uh, and disinformation. Uh, and I, I think that uh, many of our listeners here in, on Zoom and on, on our uh, live streaming uh, benefited uh, and, and received a lot of information and probably the most important message that the definition of Israel as a settler colonial state, the definition of Israel as an apartheid state, the definition of the Nakba as ethnic cleansing and the policies of Israel today as genocidal is not a matter of political opinion. It's a result of industrious, professional, and accurate research. And I think when you go around and talk to people about Palestine, you should understand that your positions are based on thorough, professional research uh, uh, and on the truth. When it comes to the truth, the Palestinians have very little to lose. Uh, and I think with this, I, I would end. I would thank you all for, for being with us. Uh, and I hope you all to see in our next uh, engagements. And again, many, many thanks for uh, uh, Dr. Abusita, Dr. Sela, 
and Dr. Yazbak for sharing with us uh, their knowledge uh, and, and time. Asanel, I pass it to you. Thank you, Professor Pape. Very well true and very well powerful. Because as part of uh, MLN's also struggle to keep the truth to the narrative of what happened with the number to the Palestinian narrative, but the truth of history itself. As part of our efforts um, to inform everyone in the audience and to our speakers, uh, the webinar has been recorded and it will be also placed onto our website and our YouTube channel. Uh, NakbaLiberation.com is the website, as you can see in the chat. Uh, please feel free to go there, share the videos with your friends, your networks, and also um, follow the website to keep up to date because this won't be the last uh, webinar we'll do. We, in fact, we plan to do more uh, webinars, especially detailing the history of the Palestinian struggle as we move forward, um, preserving the truth from the lies and deceits. So once more, I would like to thank uh, Professor Pape for moderating, and Dr. Rona for sharing her insights and for the documentary, Dr. Salman uh, as well, and also to Dr. Hiba. Thank you everyone for joining us today and we will see everyone next time on our next webinar. Thank you very much. Bye everyone.